So ladies and gentlemen, super uber producer Kevin Feige, the producer Tova Leiter, who brought him here. Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Feige and Tova Leiter. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's very, you're too kind. That's what you get for creating a cinematic <clears throat> universe where fans can go basically escape and delight with and so on and so forth. And we just saw a sample of all those movies and there's 11 more to go. So we want to thank you. You're going to watch all 11 right after this? <laughs> yes. Nice. But I have one question. Do you get to sleep at all? <laughs> I, I, I do. I, you know, six hours or so, seven hours. Really? Usually. Okay. You need your sleep. It's very <laughs> important. But you have so much to do. It's crazy. It's all fun. I mean, it's all stuff that I dreamed of doing when I was a kid growing up. And as, uh, as was just mentioned, when I was an intern, uh, losing 40 bucks a day because I would take a super shuttle to my internship uh, because cab, there was no Uber back then, uh, <laughs> and cabs were not reliable. Uh, and expensive. To go to, yeah, to go to a building right on the other side of this building uh, where I started with, with uh, Lawrence Schuller Donner, Richard Donner. Uh, so this lot means a lot to me. So how did you even get yeah. to that position <clears throat> with Lawrence Schuller and the X-Men and so on and so forth? I was in attendance at uh, uh, USC Film School, yeah. and they had uh, postings for internships. And a lot of my friends were getting internships, and I thought, uh, and they were working for people I'd never heard of or businesses I'd never heard of, and I thought, you know, I'll, I'll work for free, but it would be great to do it for somebody you know or respect. And I walked in and saw Donner, Schuler Donner Productions, Richard Donner, of course, did Superman, Lethal Weapon Goonies, and I just like, the room got dark and a <laughs> spotlight was on that, and I literally like tore the, tore the number off and, uh, and uh, sent in my resume. It was, to this day, it's the only resume I've ever, I ever put together and filled out it was for that internship right over there. Oh my God. Uh, and then many years later, this theater, believe it or not, uh, has a little MCU history in it. Tell me. Tangential MCU history. This was where uh, my partner, Nate Moore, uh, at Marvel, and I watched Creed for the first time and said, uh -huh. hey, that Ryan Coogler is pretty good. <laughs> um, it, was a, it was a press screening in this theater. And I don't usually go to press screenings. I, you, you think it's, yes. I, I like to see movies with real audiences. Yeah. The place went crazy for Creed. They were cheering, they were standing. It was, you'd never know it was a press, uh, a press screening. Uh, but that was, as I just walked in, I was like, I've been in this theater. Wow. Isn't that a fascinating story, guys? Come on. <laughs> That's trivia. <laughs> That's trivia you didn't know. All right. Well, it means a lot to you, so it means a lot to us. That's a kind way of saying. Yes. Not that interesting. <laughs> <clears throat> so, you have made very successful movies, many successful movies, and they're success successful in every respect. In other words, they're visually arresting, they're emotional, they're funny and entertaining, and the big box office. And what does it take to make a good movie? I'm asking because I was in the development business here at Warner Brothers, was my first job as VP and President of Major. So we spent so much money and effort on developing scripts, and so few of them actually materialized. And obviously, you've been able to do those 10 movies, you know, or in the, the last 10 years, all those movies, and they're all so good, there's something, there's some formula, there's some kind of a concept that you have that I'd like you to share with us. Well, it, it, I wish it were, uh, uh, you know, there's a formula that, that I could just uh, uh, divvy out to everybody. The truth is, we, we uh, came about as a studio in an interesting way. We were tasked with making two movies in 2008. Um, I had been a part of Marvel up to that point for about five or six years. Uh, as was mentioned, the X-Men films, the early Fantastic Four films, um, uh, the, uh, the first Daredevil film, um, 
uh, at the, the Sam Raimi Spidey films, which were definitely the, the high point. But it was really an amazing opportunity. I got to go from film school right. into an amazing five-year film school where I got to see how each different studio worked at the highest levels and the inner workings. Um, Marvel didn't have a lot of control or power. Um, didn't? Back then, did not. Um, uh, the, the, those characters were licensed to those studios, and those studios paid for them and had almost all the control. You know, there were certain things, you know, Wolverine couldn't have eight claws on one hand. You know, there was something that would right. never happen anyway. Right. Um, or Spider-Man's costume couldn't be green or something, <laughs> which maybe we'll do now. We can, now we can do it. <laughs> but, uh, but I learned that just by sort of ingratiating yourself with the filmmakers and, and having them realize, I was just excited to be there. I was just excited to be a, near a movie and near a group of people making a movie. So I got to learn what to do, what not to do. So by the time we became our own studio and got financing to, to make Iron Man, um, we got to use, I got to use everything I, I learned, good and bad, to try to focus our own vision on what we wanted. But to your question about development, we said we're making Iron Man, it's coming out this day. Wow. And then we had to do it, no matter what, because we wouldn't have had a studio. Marvel didn't have any money on the line, but they had the film rights to 10 characters, which are most of the Avengers now, um, were on the line. And we had to make that movie. So our development ratio is one to one. We choose a movie we're going to make, we choose the date we're going to release it, and then come hell or high water, we're going to make it, you and we're going to make it great. You still have to get a good script, though, and we, that's we, one of the hardest things. It is, but it also, we never stop. So we, we work on the script during production. We work on the script in post, and we um, uh, work on the script throughout uh, 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 the entire process. So what you need are the pieces and the concepts, and yes, the script. And we've gone into production on movies that have had great scripts and still needed a lot of work. Right. We've gone into production on... Uh, Movies that had solid structures and really great scenes, but we had to keep figuring it out. And as you say, you know, keep making the plane as it's going down the runway. Um, and in order to do that, you need a couple of things. You need an amazing team around you, and you need to trust that team around you, and you need that team to trust you. And we've been very lucky with all the filmmakers we've worked with because, number one, they've all wanted to work with us. They've wanted to make a... a uh, a big, crowd-pleasing, fun, meaningful movie. Um, and they won't stop, no matter what. I mean, it's easy, to, it's easy to stop, and it's easy to settle, and we don't do that. Sometimes frustratingly late in the process. Uh, we talk famously about the tag on Avengers, where all the, where all the characters are eating shawarma, yeah. and how we shot that the day after the premiere. Uh, and it did not get on the international prints, but it still got on the domestic prints uh, because we had an idea late in, in the cutting room because we'd always talk about the Avengers. What's great about the Avengers is not just big action and, and, and throwing uh, ships around and punching Leviathans, but just those characters who have no business being in the same room, much less the same <laughs> movie together. And, and we used to talk about just them on a bus because there's a famous comic panel of all of them just riding a bus. Um, and we were in post well on our way to finishing, and I was like, you know what, we never did that, we never did that bus scene. We never had them sit, just sitting around. We were working on the scene where he's, uh, uh, Tony Stark falls from the sky, Hulk catches him, and he goes, shawarma, you ever had shawarma? I don't know what it is, but I want to try it. <laughs> Joss Whedon goes, you know, this movie ended with all them sitting around eating shawarma. It'd be the best <laughs> film of all time. And I went, I went, that's a great idea. But we moved on. And I went to my then assistant, Jonathan Schwartz, who's now uh, in Australia producing uh, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings that goes into production, <laughs> goes into production in a few months. Um, I, said, uh, I said, go take a picture of every shawarma restaurant within a two-mile <laughs> radius of, I think, the four seasons where the junket was going to be. And, then, and he put a beautiful packet together, and the next day I handed it to Joss. And he goes, what's this? And he goes, you're kidding. <laughs> I said, we're going to do it after. The only time all the actors are back together is at the junket. Wow. And we shot it, and we were cutting it on the film truck uh, uh, right that second, right after we shot it, to get it, to get it going. And to add insult to injury, there was a billboard for the Avengers right above us. <laughs> There's a picture of that somewhere. I don't know. <clears throat> so it's about 
like this, we will not have a studio anymore if this movie isn't the best movie it can possibly be. And when you don't have competing forces or, or people who want to make different movies, yes. or when you have a shared right. vision, right. Um, which, which we've been very lucky to have on, on, on most of our films, the, the tide can, can, can sweep that way. And when you have the trust of, of uh, the people paying the bills and the trust of the studio paying the checks, um, it's, you can do a lot. You can do Absolutely. I mean, Woody Allen used to go and reshoot and redo and all of that stuff. It's so great, and, and that always used to be, there used to be stories of reshoots in the, in the press. When I started in the building right over there, uh, it literally was the dawn of the internet and the dawn of film blogging. Um, and ain't it cool news and people talking back, and now it's, we live in the hell pit we live in today. But at the time, <laughs> it was like, wow, people are, have, have opinions on, on movies. Um, and on X-Men 1, uh, they didn't like anything about it. And there, was, and there was the quote, well, it's a Marvel movie, so you know it's going to be bad. Be because of the movies that yes. were referenced uh, up front. Yeah. Um, uh, they, they were not great Marvel movies in the 90s. Uh, and I went, and I learned a couple things then, too. Don't listen to them. <laughs> and the proof will be when most people, regardless of what they what they read or what they hear about or what the rumor is. If they buy a ticket and the lights go down, it's a clean slate. And you can win them right. back right from the start of the, of, the movie, right. of the movie itself. That's what happened on, on X-Men. But reshoots what you, was a bad word. Oh, this movie's in reshoots, there must be a problem. Totally. This movie's in reshoots, there must be yes. a problem. Um, reshoots are key to our films, starting with Iron Man 1. Because it's great, and, and we always say, you know, we're, we're, we're smart filmmakers. At, at Marvel, but we're not, you know, we're not geniuses. And the best way to give notes on a movie is to watch the movie. So we make the movie and then watch it and go, oh yeah, no, that's not, that's not right. <laughs> that doesn't work. And have a system now that, uh, that can be quite precise and quite efficient in uh, sometimes one day, sometimes 15 days, sometimes more to, to go in and, and uh, continue to make the movie the best it can be. Wow. Well. And getting the actors to come in and doing all of that stuff. Amazing. When we, when we schedule our films, we schedule the production period, and then we schedule the additional photography period. Really? Um, for, say, two or three months after the director's cut's delivered. And people don't ask us anymore because they know it's the system, but they would go, oh, what will you be reshooting then? And we go, we don't know. <laughs> if we knew, we wouldn't do it. Yeah. Um, but we know there'll be something, and we need everyone to be together so we can do it on whatever dates. I wish it was like this on every movie, but of course it can't. It has to be a certain kind of, as you said, trust of the people who are paying the bills and trust in, in the system that it works like this. And obviously it does. You know, I think it's fantastic as a producer myself, I can tell. So let me ask you about another facet of it because I was reading about you and one of the things was that you got... Um, an award from uh, Henry Bollinger, right, for a PR award, mm -hmm. publicity mm -hmm. award. And he said that you um, understood and appreciated the role that publicity and promotion play in a movie success. And that led to a string of blockbuster feature film. I'm quoting him. So what do you think were your contribution in that regard, other than wearing the hat of every movie that uh, you're doing, to, you know, well, I, I'm, to uh, word publicity and promotion? I'm fascinated with publicity. I'm fascinated with promotion. I'm fascinated with, with marketing, in large part because as a fan, when I was a kid, it was all one experience. I was, again, this is pre-internet. <laughs> I was excited to walk into a movie theater and see a new poster. For, uh, for you know, a new movie that I maybe even didn't know was coming. Uh, I, uh, I went to the movies once, I don't remember what we were seeing, but there was a poster for the re-release of Star Wars, and on the side, it's a blue poster, and it had a red banner on the side that said, uh, uh, with the first trailer for Revenge of the Jedi. And I got so excited, I like spilled my popcorn all <laughs> over the ground, like a moron. Um, uh, but to me, and then later, uh, uh, you know, when, when, I don't know, Back to the Future 2 or 3 was coming out and I was in junior high school or high school in the AV department, um, uh, I gave one of our video cameras to a friend of mine who had a car and said, the, the poster's got to be out soon. Go to, the, go to the theater and video, if you see it, videotape the poster. We didn't have cell phones with cameras then. 
And he came back, and there was not only the poster of the Back to the Future 2, but this, the cardboard standee to it. Oh. I was so excited. They were both standing there like that. It was so cool. Um, but to me, it was all the, that, that, that was an extension of the, of the experience. Or the first look on, uh, on Entertainment Tonight, uh, which used to be about entertainment and about movies. <laughs> and it might still be. I haven't seen it. It's um, more about divorces now. Right. That's, um, uh, so for me, it was all part of the, of the experience. Even going to get in the glasses at Burger King uh, uh, was part of the experience for me, or the Happy I Meal see. toys. Um, and I was never cynical about that. That was an extension of the, of the experience. If, if I anticipated all those things and then went to see the movie and it wasn't good, I'd be crushed. So there was, you never lose sight that nothing matters more than the film itself. But that's what's so fun about Comic-Con. That's what's so fun about putting teaser trailers out. That's what's so fun about even first look uh, images. I remember choosing the, the, the very first picture of, of Iron Man to go out. We did two. We did one, which was the first picture of the Mark I, and then another one, which was, which was Downey for the first time, uh, uh, hammering the helmet. And I remember we were all concerned about his arms. Do his arms look big enough? Um, uh, but I enjoy that because I think about it from the, from the uh, focal point of being in the audience and being exposed to it for the first time. Is it representing the movie we're making? So it's the whole <clears throat> world around it. Yeah, and again, having a team, we have the greatest marketing department in the world at, at, uh, at Disney yeah. uh, right now. Maybe in the history of movies, they're the greatest. And sometimes we have a movie like Ragnarok and we're like, we're trying something here, and it's a little crazy, so good luck. And then they deliver us the teaser that you see, see for Ragnarok, which is a friend from work, um, was essentially one of the first trailers they showed us. And, and it was great, and it was amazing. And even, and Taika watched and went, oh, we gotta make that movie. <laughs> it's main event time. He's a friend from work. Oh, come on. Okay, so um, we have to open up the questions of the students. Hi, Kevin. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Valerie, and I'm a producing student. And I can say that Marvel movies, personally, are famous for their characters. So, it, said, it is said that every person has a spirit animal, but I believe that the biggest fan of Marvel should have a Marvel spirit character. What would be your Marvel spirit character and why? Well, first let me compliment you on a new spin on the question, who's your favorite Marvel hero? So that, <laughs> that is, was wonderfully done. Um, and Thanks. of course, that's a, I've always equate that, of course, to I have two kids. People say, oh, who, which one's your favorite? Um, uh, that doesn't work. Um, uh, uh, but I will say that, uh, that usually the answer to that question is whatever I'm working on now <laughs> and whatever is, is encompassing the, the majority of my, uh, of my uh, uh, time or brain space. Uh, but because I'm still nostalgic off of Endgame and still can't believe, literally can't believe that I'm sitting here talking to you in an era where I finished the Infinity Saga <laughs> and, and uh, uh, have done our 22, 23 Counting Far From Home movies in, in Infinity Saga and, and, and brought that to a close. Um, so I'm, I'm nostalgic for, uh, for Iron Man, for where it started and where it finished. And the, and the character that we very purposefully, all of our instincts went into that, choosing that character from, from all of the, it's true we didn't have uh, the marquee characters, meaning the characters that either already had a movie or already had a TV show or an animated series. The other studios had, had X-Men, Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, Hulk. Um, we had everything else, but Iron Man seemed very unique and very special. And I remember saying to a marketing, speaking of marketing department at Paramount, because Paramount released that, uh, that if we do our job right, Tony Stark will be as famous as Iron Man then Tony Stark will be as well known a household name as, as Iron Man, because that's how interesting uh, the character yes. has to be. 
and, uh, and of course, the very first decision, literally the first decision I made as the, and was allowed to make and allowed to try to pursue um, as president of Marvel Studios was casting Robert Downey Jr. And it felt fun to do that because we knew it would either be great or the biggest dumpster fire <laughs> ever. Uh, and there's very little wiggle room, and it ended up being great, and he ended up, I always say, no RDJ, no MCU. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hey, Kevin. Um, looking forward to the new uh, Disney Plus shows. Um, and so my question is, are there any other uh, avenues that Disney and Marvel are exploring in terms of putting out content, like maybe VR or something that you could talk about? Well, uh, there's an experience happening right now in Santa Monica and a couple of places around town called The Void, which is a VR experience set in the MCU, which I highly recommend oh, wow. and has our characters and many of our actors in it and, uh, and is a fun new way of experiencing the story. Um, but Disney Plus is the big one, right? Continuing the movies and, and as we've announced, we'll be doing uh, four movies uh, starting in 2021. Uh, but Disney Plus has been amazing because for the first time we've been able to do sort of this long form narrative storytelling. We've been doing that over 10 years in 23 movies, but to do it in our six hour um, epic mega series, whatever we want to call it, for Falcon and Winter Soldier, for WandaVision, for Loki, which are all uh, about to go into production, uh, has been amazing and, uh, to flex a new storytelling muscle and, uh, and expand the MCU because those, the, those tie directly right from Endgame and then go directly into our uh, uh, next few movies. So I think expanding that MCU experience truly from the, the streaming platform to the screen uh, is, is a fun challenge for us. And again, 23 movies in, 10 years of Marvel Studios for me, almost 20 years at Marvel for me, uh, to have a new uh, a way of storytelling is great and keeps everybody, most of us at Marvel Studios have been around uh, 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 10, 10 plus years at least. And, uh, and it's been amazing to, to, to be able to have this new way of telling stories, which we haven't started rolling on any of them yet. Literally two weeks we start, uh, but the scripts are great, the stories are great, and again, we have the trust of people paying the bills to do some, some very interesting things with those shows. Can't wait. Are there any current plans on bringing more LGBT plus characters into the MCU, specifically the T trans characters? Yes, absolutely, yes. Awesome. And, and, uh, and very soon. In a movie that we're shooting right now. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, moving forward, how do you see the MCU becoming more inclusive and diverse as the showrunner? And has the success of Black Panther and Captain Marvel opened the door for more inclusive features down the line? Yes, I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it was always the plan for us. Every time we do a movie, we hope it's going to succeed so that we can make another movie. That's always, that's always the idea. And with those two films in particular, Black Panther and, and Captain Marvel, uh, we wanted to keep showcasing heroes from the comics that represent the world that goes to see our movies. Um, so our intention was always to continue to, to do that. What's exciting is that both those movies were such big hits that it squashed any sort of uh, uh, question otherwise, and I hope and I think have inspired other companies around the world to, to, to do the same thing uh, uh, and tell those different types of stories. And behind the scenes as well, I mean, the, the, uh, both films we have coming out in 2020 are directed by women. Uh, two of the three Disney Plus shows that I just mentioned directed by uh, uh, women. We've got uh, three other shows that we've announced, but we haven't announced the, the players. Um, spoiler alert, two out of three of them are women. Um, uh, and it makes for better stories. I say when, you, when you're sitting at a table and if everybody looks like you, you're in trouble. Um, you're not going to get the best, the best story out of that. Yeah. Hi. Um, what do you think it was the key of this? Of this sorry, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Um, what do you think it was a key of the success of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and what do you think about its impact on the current uh, filmmaking industry? I think uh, uh, the key to the success was uh, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko and the dozens of writers and artists that created an amazing world over the course of 40-plus years, 50-plus years, uh, in the case of, uh, of uh, 
Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, who did the uh, Captain America, 80 years uh, uh, in publishing. It's, it's amazing. And, and, you know, I think one of the unfair things of the universe is that Jack Kirby died before he got to see any of this happen. And I'm so happy that Stan Lee got to do 22 uh, MCU cameos for us and was there every step of the way with us, which was, uh, which was amazing. But I do think it's a testament to, to the work they did. And not just them, by the way. <clears throat> the tradition that, <clears throat> excuse me, publishing had that we have in films of, of changing the storytellers, of the, of the new artists and new storytellers um, putting their own imprints on the characters. That's how these characters can last for decades and decades. Uh, in publishing, and I'm hoping, can last decades and decades in, uh, in uh, the cinematic arts um, because you continue to change and Look at Thor. Look where Thor started with Ken Branagh. Look where Thor's going yes. in, uh, with, uh, with Taika. And, and that's a testament to the way these characters can evolve and in that case, a testament to Chris Hemsworth and his acting abilities. So there's too many people uh, that's responsible for it. I also think from the comics and the movies, there is a sense of escapism, of course, which is a, a, a fun reason to go to the movies, but also a sense which ultimately the Avengers is about. The Avengers are a bunch of people who don't look like one another, who don't always like one another, who put aside those differences to fight for the greater good, um, which is ultimately what the Avengers are about. I think, I should say, I hope that's one of the reasons it resonates around the, around the globe like that. Um, no, when they all stand in the circle like yes. this and suddenly, okay, there's power and yeah. unity, there's no question. Yeah. Uh, that shot was shot in a, uh, in a warehouse in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, and for months was just, you know, they looked, it was, keep in mind, Hulk wasn't there, Iron Man wasn't there. So it was the human characters going around this green screen. And I'm like, that's supposed to be the biggest shot in the whole movie. <laughs> All right, let's see. And then, of course, VFX masters do their job. But it wasn't until we were on the mix stage with Silvestri's score hitting right when the Hulk roars yes. and, the, and the Chitauri alien comes down. And it hit, and it, and it got me, and I got chills, and I looked over to Joss, and I went, it's going to work. <laughs> it's going to work. Um, what has it had, what have our movies had on the impact uh, of, uh, of cinema in general? I don't, I don't uh, know, really. I hope, and I don't think anyone can know until for years afterwards. Um, but we're 10 years on, and, and you know, there are probably people in this audience who were kids, who were five years old, six years old, seven years old when Iron Man came out. Um, and I love the idea that... that uh, that our movies can inspire the next generation of storytellers the way my favorite movies inspired me. I hope that's how, how it uh, has the effect. I also like the effect that it still brings people to the movie theaters and reminds people of that communal experience of going to the movies. I sat in the middle of uh, a theater in Westwood opening night of Endgame, which I would not done in years, and watched the whole movie, and it was maybe the most amazing experience of my uh, entire life, mainly because they liked it and we worked hard on it. But, <laughs> Being in that, being amongst the people on that experience um, is something only movies, only movies can do. It's true. They Thank come out for those Thank movies. Thank you. Have a good night. Hello. Um, I'm studying filmmaking, so I wanted to ask you a question. Um, what are the criteria for choosing a director? Uh, the criteria usually comes down to um, uh, two things. Do something that gets gets on our radar, and, and, and it doesn't have to be a big, giant movie. It can be a clever uh, show, as in the case of the Russos. It can be a smaller film, in the case of uh, a cop car that John Watts, uh, who did the Spidey films for us, directed, or The Rider, which Chloe Zhao, who's doing uh, uh, The Eternals, uh, directed. Get, do something that, that, that showcases you know, who you are and the potential of what you can do. Then we have a lot of meetings and see if we're on the same page creatively, see if, uh, if um, uh, you know, that this is somebody we can spend day in and day out with for the next three years, um, <laughs> which is important. Uh, but it really comes down to uh, um, uh, do something that, that makes a mark, regardless of the scope or the size, uh, and that seems to showcase how clever you can be, uh, is what basically it comes down to for us. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, 
Uh, my name is Jasmine Turner. I'm a BFA producing student here. And I was curious about, um, well, with the rise of the MCU has also come, of course, the enormous fan base that's come with it. And it's a very diverse fan base. You have people who, and I say this with endearment because we're all nerds here, uh, uber nerds who like, grew up on the comics and the TV shows like myself. And you have people who like make YouTube videos where they comb through every frame trying to predict and analyze everything. And then, of course, you still have just the casual moviegoer who's being introduced to these characters and this lore for the first time uh, through the film. So I was curious on how you stay true to your artistic vision with your team and also navigate the desires and expectations that the audiences have for these films. Mm. Well, uh, excellent question. It can become, uh, uh, oh, if, I, if we thought too much about it, if we thought too much about pleasing everybody about everything, <clears throat> we would collapse into a fetal position and never do anything. Um, so we don't do that. We think mainly about what we think would be interesting, what we think would be cool, what we think would fulfill a promise we uh, set up, what we think would um, grow the MCU in an unexpected way uh, that people uh, aren't anticipating, um, killing half of your heroes, for instance. Um, uh, and that's, but but it, 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 it is true that we always make the films with the intention of them working for people who've watched every other film we've made and for people who've never seen one of our movies. And yes, with Infinity War and Endgame, it gets tougher at that point, but, but uh, we test screen all of our movies, like additional photography, test screening. I don't know why, never become too arrogant that you think you don't have something to learn from an audience uh, would be one piece of advice I would give you. Uh, test screenings are horrible. They're painful, they're terrible. All these people who aren't making movies, I'll give, I'll give you my opinion. Um, and you, I sit in the back and pull my hat down. Yeah. But I stay there and I listen. Um, because there are things you don't see. There are things you can't, not just does a joke work or not, but, but does a bit of logic work or not. Um, is there a reference that's just too deep and you're like, you know what, that reference just for the three of us, not worth it. Um, uh, and on that, uh, in those test screenings, there are questionnaires. And you know, from, from probably Avengers 1, we've had the question, have you seen, you know, which of these movies have you seen, and now it's just come down to, uh, have you seen other MCU movies before? And the next question is, do you think you have to have seen the other movies to enjoy this movie? Mm -hmm. And here's what happens almost every time. The people who write, yes, I've seen every one, then go, do you have to see them to enjoy the movie? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But for the people who go, no, I, this is the first time, I go, number one, Who's this person? <laughs> and where do we find them? But, but they go, no, you know, how many of you have seen Zero? Do you think you have to have seen other movies? No, I loved it, I enjoyed it. Um, and I always default to uh, my experience watching Harry Potter movies. I never read the Harry Potter books. My kids aren't, aren't old enough, aren't into it yet. And I didn't read them when they first came out. But I went to see every Harry Potter movie, opening weekend. And I saw it, and I enjoyed it, and then I forgot all about it and didn't think about it again until the next Harry Potter movie came out. And those movies were so well made because I could follow it all. I, I could follow it, I could track it. So occasionally I have to go, who was that? Oh, right, that was the, all right. But for the most part, I could totally track it. Now, if I had watched every movie 10 times, if I had read every book, <laughs> I bet there are dozens of other things in there that I would see and appreciate. But they never got in the way of me just experiencing it as a pure story. So that's kind of what we try to navigate, is if an Easter egg or a reference or something is so prevalent that it gets in the way of the story you're telling, so that people who aren't aware of it go, what is this, what's happening? Then we usually pull back on it. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, uh, first of all, I wanna say it's a huge honor to be able to ask you a question, and I also wanna thank you for what you've done for cinema. Um, sorry, I'm very, very nervous. Uh, one of the greatest things about the Marvel Cinematic Universe is the excitement of finding out who the next character is. I still remember to this day where I was when I found out that Spider-Man was finally joining the MCU. I was at a where final. were you? I was at a final, and I was using my phone when I shouldn't have. <laughs> and uh, I found out, and I ran out, because I had to call my friend to tell him <laughs> he's, he's home, homecoming. Um, <laughs> Uh, so my question is, what's the process of choosing the characters to come, and how does this affect the future storylines and the future phases that you're planning? Well, uh, sometimes it's, you're choosing the title hero. You're choosing which, which uh, 
um, you know, main character, main team you want to bring to the screen. And oftentimes, um, it's as you're making and developing the movie, who, who, who will come into it, who will fit into it. Um, Doctor Strange, the next Doctor Strange film, for instance, uh, features some new MCU characters that uh, will be making their debut in that movie that you won't expect or won't guess who it is, uh, but we found a cool way to, to make it work because we needed a particular, um, we will want to make a particular type of movie there, and there was a character we always wanted to do something with who we think will fit really well there. You mentioned Spider-Man and Civil War. You've heard the stories that it was always touch and go. Were we going to be able to make the deal with Sony or not? That happened again recently. <laughs> um, but that was happening the first time while we were writing and making Civil War. So while Joan Anthony Russo and Chris Marcus and Steve McFeely um, uh, uh, and Nate Moore on that movie were in the room developing it, I'd be running in, in and out being like, I think it's going to be Spidey. And then I'd go, forget it. It's not going to work. <laughs> And by the way, also even uh, Downey. We didn't have a deal with Downey. So it's like, it's looking good on Downey. Okay, it's, it's, versus, uh, it's, versus, it's Cap versus Iron Man. I don't know, might not, might not be Downey. All right, it's going to be Cap versus who? Uh. Um, so we started developing, uh, not writing full versions, but being prepared to make a shift if we had to. Because I said before, we choose a movie, we announce a movie, it's coming out. Um, and, and we've been very lucky that usually it's worked out. It was during those conversations that Nate said, what about Black Panther? What about, what about bringing T'Challa into this civil war as a third party who didn't have, who didn't have uh, um, an allegiance to either side, who had his own issue, and if we don't have Spider-Man, and God forbid if we didn't get Robert, there'd be another element, a new fresh element the, to make the movie worthwhile. We ended up getting it all and it ended up being great, but, uh, but it, can, it can vary, the choice of... Uh, uh, sometimes, like, like Shang-Chi, we've wanted to make that movie for a long time. We want to make a movie with a, with a 98% uh, uh, Asian cast. Um, uh, and then you talk about, as you develop the movie, who, what other heroes can you, can you bring into it if you need them? And in the case of Black Panther, it was the greatest thing that ever happened. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank God. <laughs> My favorite movie. Uh, hello, sorry, my first question was asked already, so I have a, another a bit nerdier question. On the fly? It's not on the paper? Here we go. Here uh, we go. Yeah. So, as of Endgame, in your opinion, who would be the strongest Marvel hero? As of Endgame? Yeah. Or as of Far From Home, I mean, it's the latest one. Up to you. I don't think that changed much. Well, I, I think it's interesting, if you, if you look at Endgame, Wanda Maximoff was going to kill Thanos. Yes. If he hadn't yes. desperately, that's as scared as I've ever seen Thanos. Mm -hmm. And if he hadn't said, decimate my entire team to get her off of me, I think she would have done it. Told you guys. And uh, <laughs> I've been saying that. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, hi, Mr. Kevin. Um, I wanted to ask a question in regards to failure, rejection, because I feel like everybody in this room if they haven't gone through it already, is bound to go through it. And um, were there any times when you were on the production of a Marvel film or when you were constructing your whole Marvel universe um, where you really felt like this wasn't going to work, things are going to go bad? And how did you manage to get through those times? It, well, it happens a lot. It happens a lot, and it kind of happens all the time. Um, and it happened, you know, I, uh, I uh, applied to film school. I got rejected from the film school I wanted to go to five times wow. before I got in. Uh, I got in at the very last moment you could get in. I was like, what is another major to do? Um, uh, the uh, Working in that building right on the other side, uh, I'd be like, am I a moron? Am I not good enough? Can I not, do I belong in this business? Um, uh, so that sort of doubt and, and failure. And along the way, certainly with, with Iron Man, even on X-Men 1, you know, finding yourself in a room uh, with the four or five decision makers making that movie, saying, you know, and I've got thoughts, I've got point of view, should I say it, should I not, am I going to, if I give them this idea, they're going to kick me out of the room for being, uh, for being uh, um, uh, not good enough or not smart enough. Uh, they didn't, thankfully. They might have thought it, but they didn't. Um, uh, to to the, the, the uh, you know, even what we were just talking about in Civil War, the deals... Uh, trying to, it happened the other day uh, with, uh, with an actor. 
if there's an actor we want for something, they come in, you give a big pitch, and you can sort of tell, oh, they're not, they're not into it. <laughs> I guess I'm a failure. Um, uh, I'll show them. We'll cast somebody even better. Uh, so so you, you ju it's just p part of it. And, uh, and um, don't linger on them is what I usually try to do. Don't, don't think too much about it. Don't, don't, don't stew in it. Move on quickly. When you're producing a movie, you have no choice. I found the perfect location. This is going to be the greatest. Uh, it just fell through. You're never going to have it. <laughs> oh, no. Well, got to make the movie. Find another location. And then it either really is better or you convince yourself it's better. Right. Um, but it, it, it's, it's constant. So get used to it and, and plow through. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm curious how you... Um, Keep up with the expectations of your viewers with casting and the storyline while keeping true to your own vision of the story. I, I mean, it's, it, it, hopefully it's by keeping true to, and I'll say not my vision, but our vision and all the people uh, uh, and the incredibly tight-knit team at Marvel Studios who make Marvel Studios what it is. Up to this point, staying true to our vision has connected with, with the fans and with the, with the moviegoers, um, even when that's uh, unexpected choices filmmakers that they haven't heard of, or actors, which still happens sometimes, uh, that they haven't uh, heard of. Um, and what used to happen was there'd be a big outcry, and people would uh, bemoan the choice and think it was terrible, <laughs> and I would say, all right, everybody, just, let's, just, let's just prove them wrong. Let's do the work. Now, and I don't know that this makes me more comfortable, they go, I don't know who that is, but we trust them. And I sort of like, don't trust us. We have to prove it. We have to work to prove it to you, which don't worry, we all, we, we do. Um, uh, but that, I mean, ultimately it's, it is uh, um, staying the course has served us well. All right. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I was wondering if you were to leave Marvel like tomorrow and look back at your career, is there a specific moment that is kind of the highlight that you would consider your personal career achievement? You know, every year at, at Marvel Studios, if you ask me that question, there'd be something because yeah. there's, there's been such, uh, uh, such an amazing, uh, obviously uh, Iron Man and the success and the audience embracing Iron Man and <clears throat> audiences embracing, uh, although at a, at a much lower level than, uh, than you remember, um, a World War II superhero movie, which we really wanted to do, or Ken Branagh directed Space Viking movie, which when I would pitch both of those movies, they'd go, what? <laughs> You're doing a World War II movie about a guy wrapped in an American flag? Well, no, his name's Steve Rogers. It's more than that. Um, uh, that those worked. Avengers was, a, was um, a, a big roll of the dice, and that that really worked was something special. And then saying, I'm sort of going through the phases. Mm -hmm. I mean, then, then saying, okay, our audience is going to find these characters once they're by themselves again, as interesting as they did when they were together and doing things like hiring Shane Black for Iron Man 3, um, and, then, and then Guardians of the Galaxy, and choosing these characters that a lot of people have never even heard of. Um, but I would have to say right now um, that we culminated, that we, that we delivered on a promise that we set out five years ago to do with Endgame, mm. and the way the world received that movie, um, it might not ever get any better than that for me. Thank that you. was pretty amazing. Right. Um, thank you for being here. Um, it was, before I, I asked my question, it was 2008. When I came out of Iron Man, I was nine years old, and that's when I decided um, to come here from Peru. Um, wow. Yeah. I, uh, that's, that's what I want the impact of our movies to be. Yeah, I'm, I'm 21 now, and I'm, I'm a BFA acting student. So I just wanted to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, wow. Uh, so it was a San Diego Comic-Con this year when it was announced that Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness uh, was going to be kind of a horror movie. What other, other genres are, do you want to explore in the upcoming Marvel movies? The, 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 there are lots, and, and it's sometimes too simplistic to just call it uh, one movie. You know, Shang-Chi is going to be so much more than a kung fu movie, but it, it has elements of that, which is we're excited about. Um, Multiverse of Madness is the greatest title we've ever come up with, by the way, which is yeah. one thing that's exciting about it. Um, and the, I wouldn't necessarily say that's a horror film, but it is, as Scott Derrickson, our director, has pitched it. 
it is, it'll be a big MCU film with scary sequences in it. The way, when I was a kid in the 80s, Spielberg did an amazing job. It, I mean, there are horrifying sequences in Raiders that I would say when I was a little kid and do this when their faces <laughs> melted. Or, or Temple of Doom, of course, or Gremlins, or Poltergeist. These are, these are uh, the movies that invented the PG-13 rating, by the way. They were PG, and then they were like, we need another. <laughs> um, but that's fun. It's fun to be scared in that way and not a, not a you know, horrific, um, uh, torturous way, but in a way that is uh, legitimately scary, because Scott Derrickson's quite good at that, but scary in the service of, of, of an exhilarating emotion. Um, and there are lots of other ones that, that I don't want to say too much because it then could, will indicate you know, future th things we're doing. But I always <laughs> say well, I, I don't believe in the comic book genre any more than I believe in a, in a, 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 a genre based on uh, novels. You wouldn't say, you know, I, I, I make movies based on novels. You go, well, what, what is it? What's the novel? Um, People who don't read comic books perhaps see the colors and the powers and, and link it all as one thing. But people who read them know they're all totally different. Um, and that's certainly true of all the Marvel. So there, there are places we haven't explored in the comics that I still think would be fun to, to go to. Thank you so much. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Um, I love the fact that you, know, you, you never can guess where a director will come from. Like, I mean, uh, you have all these directors who are just doing lower budget features like What We Do in the Shadows, Short Term 12, uh, Creed, I guess, would be lower budget. Um, and I was just kind of curious, when you hire these directors who really have not done something to the scale of you know, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, is there anything that you tell them? Any advice? We basically say <clears throat> we have an amazing team in place, and we have and will hire great artists and great artisans and great technicians. Um, so <clears throat> a terrible analogy I use, because I don't know much about it, is a movie is a big giant ship. And we want the captain to take us to new, the captain at the helm with the thing, take us to a new place. Take us somewhere we haven't been before. If you have the same captain every time, they have their favorite routes, they have their tricks, they have it. But a new captain can guide us somewhere. And we've got the people in the boiler room that can keep the engine going and the sails and choose your metaphors. We've got all those people who can do that. Um, and that's how you go to interesting places. And yes, we're there. If it's like, oh, head right to the iceberg. Well, that could be neat. Let's see how close we can get. <laughs> that's close. That OK. <laughs> and we move away. Um, but that's truly what it's about. It's about people who we think have the, the energy and the stamina and the desire to captain a ship that large uh, and an interest and a passion in taking it to places it, it hasn't been before. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. <clears throat> My question is, what was the most difficult situation that you have to solve in a short time, like as a producer in Marvel? Uh, it's a good question. There, there are a lot, and, it's, and also, again, at Marvel Studios, there's so many other people that, uh, that solve the problems and that are on the set day in and day out where I now come and go. Um, my favorite place to solve problems is the cutting room. That's my favorite place. Mm -hmm. You're back, you know, a movie starts with, with four or five of us around a table talking about what it should be. Then it expands to hundreds, thousands, including visual effect vendors, of people. And then it comes back down to five or six people in a cutting room. And those are my favorite ends uh, of the process <clears throat> and the places where you can make the biggest differences and the biggest impacts. Um, and my favorite thing to do is, yes, is to work on a scene or a sequence or a challenge in that cutting room of how to tell a story, how to get an, an intention that we wanted across um, and it not working for some reason. And, and being able to solve it uh, is fun. And screening it again and have it, and have it work and then showing it to audiences. And they would never guess in a million years that there was a problem with any whatever particular sequence this was. Um, that's my favorite type of problems to solve. I can't think off the top of my head of a, of a, of a huge problem we had to deal with uh, right away. Um, but, uh, but, but it happens every day. It happens every day. And having the team that can often do it, f solve it for you before you even knew it was a problem. Actually, those are my favorite. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Hello. Oh my gosh, this is so exciting. <laughs> um, so I was wondering, are certain character choices, such as Steve and Peggy's ending in Endgame, um, 
sort of predetermined in advance by more higher up people like you? Or are those sort of decisions decided by the storytellers of the individual film, such as Marcus and McFeely and the Russo brothers? Mm. Well, in that case, it was all the above because we were all together in uh, in the room as it was as it was uh, being put together on those two movies, and <clears throat> those two movies were developed at the same time, and it was relatively early on, before even Infinity War had been completely written, that that the idea came up, and I and I think it was Marcus McFeel, I don't remember exactly, uh, to have Old Man Steve on the bench and to hand the shield over, and then to end the movie with, with two things. One, Cap gone, out of the, out of the picture now, <clears throat> which is where it was headed, but also getting his happy ending. Getting his happy ending with, with Peggy and the dance and the date that he didn't get at the end of his first movie. And everyone's like, oh, well, that's that. That's great. <laughs> and when you have an anchor of an idea like that, and when you're like, we think this is the perfect ending, a lot of the movie can be in shambles, mm -hmm. and you're feeling okay because you because it's worth working right. on because you know where you're where you're headed. Yeah. Um, so in most cases, it is collaborative, uh, the way these ideas come up. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <clears throat> can we do one more? What? One more. Yeah. Well, thank you for sticking around and answering extra questions. Really appreciate it. I just want to ask you about your process uh, in terms of your work ethic. What do you do personally that allows you to balance so many high quality projects all at once? Obviously, we know you have a huge team that supports you, but what do you do personally that allows your attention to, to be divided in such a way that you can still produce hit after hit after hit? Well, you don't, you don't think you're producing hit after hit. You think you're um, barely scraping by and finishing on time. Uh, <laughs> Uh, is how it feels. And yes, the team is the real answer to that question. And having the team in Australia right now, in London right now, in Atlanta right now, in the cutting room uh, uh, at uh, Disney right now, um, that allows it to happen. Um, in terms of, uh, I've always just thought that way. I've always been able to be, have a very in-depth conversation about a particular part of uh, something in one room and then go into the next room and talk about a totally different project. Um, and, and segment the, 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 the day like that. Um, so I, I've always been able to do it, and I always say, <clears throat> if I wasn't making these movies for real, I'd just be you know, sitting on a street <laughs> corner somewhere thinking of them and right. drawing them on a sidewalk. Uh, it's just always going. Uh, so having an outlet to hand them off to other people to then bring to life is pretty, is pretty fun. Wow. Pretty fun. Thanks, Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank he you. said he was going to come, and here he is, and he was supposed to leave 15 minutes ago, and he stayed because of Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.